this is my content. If people were to find me, they're not going to find a bunch of trends. They're going to find my content and rabbit hole through my content. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think the aim is to try and be the trend rather than trying to follow the trend. Welcome back to another episode of The First Gems. Hey, y'all. Hey. So today we have an amazing guest joining us today. You all may know her by Fola Hantis. I call her Fola. Um, she is a digital creator, travel curator, and natural hair and beauty educator. So give it up for Fola, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yes, of Lovely. course. Thank you so much for joining. Like, we have been wanting to interview you for so long. I feel like you've been on all of our, as we were curating our guest list, because, you know, we stopped producing episodes for a while. And as we were curating our guest list, we're like, okay, we got to have Fola on. We got to have Fola on. And now that Here's we finally Fola. have <laughs> Yeah, no. Now that we finally have you on, like, it's definitely, like... So I was like, wow, we finally, we finally did it. We finally got out of the group chat. <laughs> you know, when you go on a trip, you're just like, yeah, we yeah. just made it out of the group chat. We're finally, like, finally made it. Yeah. Thank you for having me again. I of appreciate course. it. We're excited for our talk today. A little yeah. girl chat. You know, Kiki. Yes. yes a little <laughs> Kiki. So yeah, we have a lot to discuss today. Like you are such an inspirational person and I know you and I met, um, well, we didn't officially meet for a while, but we did the 2020 pandemic don't rush challenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's how we met. Yeah. And when, when was our first link up actually? I don't even remember. I just know that we did like a cute foodie date. I, feel, I just can't remember when exactly. Yeah. Was that the first time? Oh, we went to the catered Nigerian um, experience. Oh, that, yes. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That was a whole, that was a full on. We saw Timmy's TikTok and we were like, we should do that. We're not going to wait to like go on a date. Like, let's just be each other's dates. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, was, I love that. No, yeah. And ever since I met you, like, it's been five since. And I know, like, we're just going to have a good old time in here today. So. Yes, before we get into the chat, though, I am somebody who loves breaking the ice just so we can all warm up, get to know each other more. Y'all know I have my icebreaker questions lined up and ready, but I will start this um, this question with you, Fola. And the question is, if you could keep one app on your phone, what app would it be? What would it be? Yeah. Um... Like you, can have, you know what? I'll give you three. How about that? I'll give you three. Okay, okay, okay. I would say the photos app because I'm like, even without social media, I want to just capture the moment, whatever that is, so I can look back on it because memories. The music app because music and memories is like, you know? And I'd want to say, I'm like, the text messages is already built in, right? Like the phone, I can't. Those are not like real apps. It's still an app. It's still an app. Right, right, right. <laughs> I was like, I want to be able to take my mom. <laughs> Should we do the apps that don't come on the iPhone? I feel like everybody's okay, going to keep. Okay, how about this? this? The apps that don't come on an iPhone, which three apps would you keep on your phone and you have to delete everything mm -hmm. else? Okay, photos definitely come on that. Okay, okay. I think I would just choose one then. I think it would just be Pinterest, Inspo, if anything. Yeah, I love I'm trying to think like everything else is kind of just tailored to, or maybe my journaling app, but I'm like, I can do that without a phone. So yeah. Everything else that I would need, like the camera is already built into the phone to text my mom's already built into the phone. Like I don't really need nothing else. I mean, okay. I guess as a career, the social media, but I'm like, if I didn't have to, if I could just yeah. live my life without it, yeah. I would. <laughs> so, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Okay. I like that. I like that you picked one too. So, all right. Anybody else who, if you had one app other than the ones that are built into the phone, which app would you keep and why? I would want to say the first one that comes to my mind is YouTube, just because I'm always on YouTube. And even if you don't, like I go to YouTube for just like answering questions. Like if I don't want to sit there and read a whole like paragraph or whatever, I'm usually just typing in questions or like tutorials or like 
recipes, you know? So I, that's my number one thing that came to mind was YouTube. I can't even shake it. Like, because I'm not really on Instagram that much these days either. So, or TikTok. So it's like YouTube. That's hard. I was going to say FaceTime because if anything else, I feel like FaceTime is one of those things, or the FaceTime app is one of those things where I can survive without text messages, without calling, but FaceTime to me is like my way I connect with my friends and my family, I feel like the most. So do, can I still say that or? It's on the, but it's on the, it already comes in. Okay, it fine. Is. I mean, I'll go, I'll We're go with make it easier on you. That's actually harder because I don't have that many apps on my phone. <laughs> But fine, I'll say Tidal, the music app, just because I listen to music on my walks in the morning, when I work out, when I shower, basically when I do anything, even when I'm working, I have jazz music playing. So I just always have music around me. Yeah, I see where you're going, Claire. Yeah, what a lot of the bass time. Um, I would say WhatsApp. That's pretty cool to be able to stay connected with family from across the everywhere <laughs> and have that on one app i think that's like that'll be enough and it's enough to replace all the social media apps like i get enough entertainment on whatsapp wow that's a good one take us take us to the you know let us connect with our uh family members overseas so for me in terms of the app that i would keep I don't know. It's really hard. I have a ton of apps on my phone. I'm the type of person where if someone mentions a new app, like I'm downloading it, I want to see how it works. I may never open it after like using it once or one or two times, but I'm definitely an app girly. I do like that Pinterest answer because I love seeing visual inspo, but I also think, okay, even though I, I don't like really making like physical vision boards, I could still make my digital vision board and use Pinterest on my um, computer. So I might have to keep TikTok. I just get so, yeah, I, I just get so, and not even to post or anything like that. Like, I just get so much inspiration from TikTok. I feel like it's like my YouTube, like Instagram reels all in one. And I, I don't know, I'm fueled by a lot of the content that I see on there. So I would definitely keep TikTok. That makes sense. TikTok is just so addicting for me. Like even as a creator, I feel like I have to tell myself to get off. Otherwise I'll just keep like not even doom scrolling. I don't even know what the term is called, but I'll just keep scrolling. And I'm just like, I've consumed too much content. I can't even think. <laughs> Does that ever get tiring though? Because you make content. Like I feel like it's kind of like yeah. with work with me, like I work in social media. So doing my own social media, I'm like, I don't even got the time for this. So is that kind of like the same thing when you're creating content where you're like, okay, I've created content. I posted my thing on this app. Like, I don't even want to look at TikTok or Instagram. Like, Yeah, no, literally right before this, I just uploaded something and I just closed the app. Once it's uploaded, I'm like, close. I just, I can't. Yeah. I'll, I'll designate a time to get on TikTok. Or sometimes if I really am not, I'm off the app. Like, it's not until I'll see on other apps, like something is trending, like, you know, Demure is trending yeah. right now. I know that because I'm on TikTok, but if I if I told myself to get off TikTok, I'd be like, oh shit, this is probably coming. Yeah. TikTok. So let me get back on TikTok. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I know what. I look, I'm low key but, addicted yeah. to that phrase. Like when I hear it, like I'm like, y'all, please don't play it out. Y'all are using it in every which way sentence. Like let it. Yeah. yeah. We got to give it. Some yeah. Five p.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> right. Like, oh, very cute. Very just cute. <laughs> Yeah. So now I'd love to have the audience know more about you, your background, your story, how you landed. I feel like we have so much to talk about, but I definitely want to give you the floor and just kind of talk about your, yeah, yeah. you know, give your little, not elevator pitch, but you know, Mm -hmm. right. than 10 floors. <laughs> you know, just in case anybody comes in and, you know, they don't know me, what they would like to know. Okay, well, my name is Fola Han, like my full name. So that's where the Fola Hantis comes from because it's like a play on Pocahontas, Fola Hantis. Because, you know, people don't be getting African names right. So you just got to lob them a little assist or whatever. But that started in high school and then I just kept it ever since. So it's like a ongoing nickname. But I did start in 2020. So I like consider myself the new creator class of like on the scene type of creator. And I kind of started in natural hair and travel. And that was like my bread and butter talking about educational natural hair content, because I feel like 
all the girls were giving. You know, we did what we could with YouTube University and the new, like natural hair movement in that era. But a lot of the girls are also like clickbaity. And I was like, you know what? Let me say what's not being said and like tell the girls they actually can't grow their hair in five days from pulling on it or massage. You know what I mean? Like just the, the things that I feel like people were like, I tried this and I tried that. And I'm Rice like, water. It's click <laughs> Sorry, they got you. Mm -hmm. But I was just like debunking a lot of stuff and just trying to help black women have a better relationship with their hair. And then with travel, just taking like, some of the travel content that I got when I was studying abroad in college. And I studied abroad twice. I did London in Paris as like a going to school internship type of program. And then I did Barbados in my last semester. So taking that type of... <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to catch you off, but I was in Barbados too for a study abroad, but we'll get to that later. Okay, okay we, got a, we got a week after. But I did do that. So I feel like a lot of people were asking me questions on like, you know, how to travel or how was it traveling or like, I was just getting people more acquainted with what the world looked like in Black people and Black spaces across boundaries, across, you know what I mean, like travel lines, whatever the case may be. But yeah, that's kind of where, how I started. And then it actually was accidental. Like the whole thing, I kind of just stumbled into it and it wasn't, I didn't, I never wanted to be an influencer. I never wanted to be a content creator. I, it never dawned on me to even step into this realm. but after college, it was a whole series of unfortunate events. My dad had ended up passing and I needed to stay home and like basically help my mom with the family business because that was something they did for like 20 plus years and I knew she couldn't handle it on her own. Her, her own. So me and my brother, just me and my brother, my, I, my, I guess my siblings, like we all like basically pitched in to make sure the business kept going because my two younger siblings needed to still be put through to college and it was just like a whole all right, Miss Girl, you got to sacrifice a little some some. So that's what it gave, as you know, the eldest sister or the eldest daughter, I should say, that kind of sacrifice. And then social media just became like an escape or a self expression and kind of just taking what the pain points of like Black women or Black people in general trying to figure out how to travel or how to have healthy hair. That was just like I kind of turned my personal page into a page and a resource for my people. And here we are, four years later, still going. Wow. And it's been great. You're killing it. It's something I kind of leaned into. And yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. But something I just kind of leaned into. Because at first it was like a hobby. It was like a, I need an escape because I kind of hate what's going on right now. And then the pandemic happening, it was just so much. You know, post-grad depression is one thing in itself. And then just all the grief and then the, the pandemic, like everything was just like on top of each other. But it went from hobby to part-time to like, okay, can I actually do this for real, for real? And then taking that, moving to LA, because I'm already from SoCal, so it wasn't too much of a leap to move. But I'm glad that my mom was also very supportive of it from the get-go, because Nigerian parents can, you know, not be as supportive in creative endeavors. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I do want you to touch on that more, too, about um, being Nigerian-American and how that do you feel like it played a role into how you are as a content creator or are you taking it seriously? Or I know you, you were stu you studied something completely different in school. And what was that like, kind of like, I don't want to say abandoning that dream and kind of pursuing content creation, but like kind of like, grieving it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The shift kind of is like, I feel like this, what I call it skill it feels so formal to be like the skill I've learned, but I'm like ingrained in me as like a Nigerian and like a child of immigrants is like to be resourceful and then to, you know, use academics as a source of like climbing the social ladder, economic ladder, whatever the case may be. So like, yeah, I pushed myself a lot through academics. Like I skipped fourth grade. That was a whole thing. I was always someone like top of my class because my dad was always like, I was the top of my class. You know how... <laughs> My parents were like, I had to walk through, da da da, walk yeah. through school. And I was like, all right, okay, well, I gotta beat it then. <laughs> I couldn't come home with nothing less than an A minus, even an A minus was something. What's, what's this minus? What's this minus here? Like, why, why is it not A plus? You know what I mean? That type of thing. So it's kind of like my willingness, my willingness, my tenacity, like those type of things I feel like were ingrained in me from a really young age. Like, I wanna say even. There's memories I have of preschool, like up until high school, like trying to get into a good college because I was born and raised in SoCal, uh, San Bernardino to be specific, which is not like 
the nicest area in SoCal. It's like kind of a rough upcoming. It's like the hood. So choosing a school out there or anything nearby wouldn't have been sufficient. Not for not for me, but especially not for my parents. So like mm-hmm. it was always a top university that I needed to get into. Berkeley was one that I got into and I studied political economy with a focus in um, poverty and social growth across the African diaspora. And that's something I got to choose. But it was like international relations was my whole, that was my thing. I thought I was going to like go, I don't even know. I had an idea of like going to Princeton after, like going to get my master's, working for the United Nations. Like that was the trajectory I saw for myself. Like I remember being in Barbados at my like, last semester, looking up like different things that was happening on the East Coast because that's where I planned to move. Because I was like, all right, once I get home, it's like I'm gone. Mm-hmm. But then everything kind of just flipped itself on its head. And then it kind of just teaches you like life really will humble you, but also you can't, I think as a type A person, and that's also another thing I've learned, like just growing up with immigrant parents is like, you can't, I think I, I learned to be a type A person because I wanted to plan and have my life figured out because I can't disappoint anyone. I can't disappoint myself, but it's like, life will teach you that whatever you got going on, Girl, bye. <laughs> like, like, like you thought, yeah. haha, that was funny. Yeah. You thought you thought you thought you had a five year plan. Oh, baby, yeah. Mm. No. So whatever I had going on, it was like absolutely not. And it was kind of like a blessing in disguise because it's something that I get to do. Like things that I'm like a hobbyist about, like talking about my natural hair is something I did in college. But like as a like, you know, to help my friends out or like traveling was like a newfound love for me when I studied abroad. So it's like things I'm getting to do now are things that I've always kind of loved as I like gotten older. So now that I get to do it full time as a job, it's like not a lot of people get this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing now, I'm like, I don't know how long I'll be doing it for, but I'm like, I enjoy where I'm at right now. And I'm, we're cruising. So when you realized you wanted to transition into social media and content creating full time, what was that like, what made you realize that? And how did you like, break it down to your mom like was it hard explaining this to her or was she I would say it wasn't hard explaining it to her because she knew that they wanted more for me so like pushing them pushing me for so long to like be like the top person in my class or to graduate you know from a public university like UC Berkeley to then come home and work for the family business that's always been there it's like she knew she didn't want that for me and my dad didn't want that for me. So it's like, she always pushed me to like, go, go see what it is that you want to do. Even though I knew that she needed that help. So like me or her seeing me just try and do something. And she's like, okay, like that's something like you could be doing that while you help me with this. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm showing her like Jackie, I know like all these people are successful. I'm like, all right, she, you know what I mean? She's a Nigerian American. I'm Nigerian American. Like I'm showing her someone who's like, has been done it do it and is still successful with it and she's like yeah I can see you doing that and it's always been supportive from day one especially with like I think with my dad was probably still around he probably would have hated it because <laughs> like I, I need the degrees like you need to get a job and da 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 so I'm like I don't think I would be doing this if things didn't happen the way they did but she was really supportive with it and I think just like leaning into this more was kind of like me just grieving the life that I thought I was going to have and being okay with letting go and letting God and just, all right, we're just going to try it out. What what else do I have to lose? I mean, I feel like I was already at rock bottom. So it's just like, well, I'm just going to keep building from here. I'm like, I feel like I've, I've taught myself to pick myself back up from where I was at. So I'm like, if I can do that or I can do this, then I can, I can reinvent myself any which way because I'm like, I didn't study marketing. I didn't study business, but I am now a business. <laughs> so okay. Yeah. And what was the um, family business? If you know? It was medical supplies. Oh, cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that takes a lot of courage. And you have to be bold to go into content creation, I feel. Especially now, because as much as you're a type A planner, like you said, you, I feel like with other careers, you can be like, okay, I want to do this. I want to work for the UN. I want to, but content creation is more so like if your content, hits it hits if it doesn't hit it doesn't hit like you know so I I bet that could be frustrating because you can't really map out where your success goes with content creation as much as like you can hope and plan but it 
it may not turn out that way. So I commend you for being so bold and courageous and standing in it and sticking with it. And yeah, I just wanted to give you your flowers for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it is actually very, it's more work than I feel like people understand it to be. I feel like there's always kind of been this disdain for influencers or creators or the sense that people are just showcasing their lives and getting money from it. But I'm like, no, we're wearing multiple hats. Like, I've learned, especially because I mean, I feel like I've just watched creators to pass time, not necessarily to like understand what their career looks like to its full degree. But I'm like, I'm my own makeup artist, my own hairstylist, my own copywriter, my own videographer, my own editor, my yeah. own like mm-hmm. all these things that like actually take what it takes to build a business. And it's like to be successful with it and then to also be the person in front of the camera, like you're also the talent, not just the person capturing the content. Mm -hmm. So having to like be comfortable on camera, especially if you're like a shy person, you're a demure person, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) real used to that aspect is a whole nother thing. I'm like, oh, I have to put myself out there for real real, and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it teaches you to be okay with yourself. I feel like in the four years that I've been doing this job I'm like I feel like I've grown this has kind of been like through my whole 20s really like I feel like 22 to now I'm 28 that seems like more than what how many years it's been but I, that's what it feels like to me <laughs> 28 I feel like we're such growing pains of like my 20s like 20s in general is just like I feel like a difficult decade but I think also putting myself in front of the camera and choosing this as a career like I feel like I have to, well, this is who I am, take it or leave it type. And I'm like, before, I think I used to be someone who like tried to people please. And it's like, with this type of job, you can't, you're, someone's always going to think something's wrong with what you're doing. And I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of this. Like, I, I just, you just have to be as comfortable with yourself because you're presenting yourself online. And so like, if you can't, then it's going to seep into your work. Yeah, people could see through that too. Like when you're yeah. kind of like fake or phony, yep, they can really like, pick up on that. So mm-hmm. yeah. And I think what's refreshing too about your content and just like watching your journey is the fact that you can tell that it comes from a genuine place of you actually wanting to educate people on their hair, on their beauty, on their makeup, on travel tips versus like you said earlier, clickbait. There's so much clickbait out there. It's actually really annoying. So (laughs) watching you is just like a breath of fresh air. And I think on top of you genuinely educating people there's also like a layer of vulnerability I feel like that you also present to people so with that have you how do you decipher between knowing what to share and then what to kind of keep private or to yourself to like protect you know your energy protect whatever it is you got going on Honestly, I, it's hard. I think that's something too that I didn't realize until I got into this that I was like, ooh, there's, I have to start drawing some boundaries. Even if I don't say them, I have to be okay with, okay, like I can't talk about this because this is how people will go and try and unfold your life before you even get a chance to say anything. So I think choosing things that I would be okay, like if somebody found out about, I don't talk about dating. Mm -hmm. On like, you know, I started to branch into lifestyle. Like I don't talk about dating because I don't think I would be comfortable if someone else saw this video of me talking about them, even if I like made it anonymous in any type of way, it just gives, it's icky to me. So I'm like, I'm not going to do it. And I also wouldn't want anybody trying to pry into my life about, oh, who's dating who in LA and blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, that's me. And I keep it cute. And we talk with my friends in a group chat and that is it. I don't know, even with my friends who I don't, aren't considered creators or like they they don't you know what I mean that's not their career of choice maybe they might do content a little bit here on the side but I feel like forcing them to be in content or like me whipping out the camera all the time like I feel it takes away from the moment or of the friendship or of the hangout and I'm like I don't want to project that onto them just because I'm trying to capture content for myself it feels selfish to me mm-hmm. so I'm like unless we're like, oh, can I get content beforehand? You know, I'm telling them like, oh, we're going to meet up. I would love to get content of da, 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 da. If they're okay with that thing, cool. But it's also like, people can also attract that and not want to be seen later. Even if it's years from now, like, hey, that video that's on YouTube of me, can you please take it down? 
I have to abide by that. I'm like, I, I don't want to be res- disrespectful of other people's feelings because it's like weird to be perceived on the internet. You know what I mean? Especially if that's not your job. So yeah, some of those things I'm like, I don't necessarily want to show my friends all the time if they don't want to be seen. I don't want to talk about dating if I'm not comfortable with that. Just certain things. I'm like, I have to be very particular about what aspects of my life I want to show. Yeah. Yeah. Even my mom sometimes I'm like, all right, maybe this is enough. I don't want people to think that they can just talk anyhow. I'm like, this is still my mom. You know what I mean? Like people, people get real nice, nasty on the internet. They think it's cute. No, for it's- real. And people feel like they're entitled. Like once you're a public facing person, they feel entitled to know certain things. Yeah. So I don't know. If- it's yeah. hard to know it. I wanted to bring it back, Fela, because we, we touched on like viral moments. Mm-hmm. And I know you have a good bunch of them. And just for like some context, I'm really close to your cousin who actually put me on to you. And mm-hmm. I remember she was showing me like your 90s throwback, like different hairstyles. And I was like, I've seen this before. And she's like, yeah, that's my cousin, Paula. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite viral moments or like what was your first viral moment? And just like, just let the people know like who you are, where you've been. My first viral moment... I'm trying to remember. I think on TikTok, it was probably some video related to my hair. I want to say, oh, it was, okay, the first one, damn, there was a lot. Honestly, I feel like the pandemic, they they (laughs) did a lot because I feel like I got used to virality, like everybody did. And now that everybody's like back to work, it's like, oh my God, my views are low. Anyway, not to Mm -hmm. get off that. But I'm pretty sure it was one where I was talking about like my hair growth journey. And then it was like Beyonce, like I was in the shower because I always have shower videos. I was in the shower and it was like me just showing my hair. My hair was way longer than it was like waist length, but it Mm -hmm. was Beyonce's speechless video. So I think it was like a little sensual, but it was like, (laughs) (laughs) it was like me showcasing my hair, but also giving tips on the thing. But it was like the, you know, the water drop. I feel like it was just nice. Like it was, you know, Mm -hmm. anyway, (laughs) like my other ones um have probably been something related to my hair like when I big chopped I like transitioned and cut my hair to like short above my shoulders and then bangs Mm -hmm. and that was a cute moment but my I think the braid style one was probably the most viral across all platforms like YouTube Twitter Pinterest Instagram TikTok like that was that I feel like that is my chef's kiss bread and butter I love that I was like Wow, that really came from an idea that me and my sister had. Well, I wouldn't say I had, but I bounced it off her. We were in the bathroom and I was just like, what if I, cause I think it was a trending topic on Twitter at the at the time that people were saying like braids aren't birthday hair or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was not an elegant style to wear. Like why would you wear braids for something so special, whatever. And I was like, mm, that don't sound right. <laughs> I was like, that don't, mm-mm. And I was just talking with my sister, like, what if I like took like the styles that we do on weaves and wigs and extensions and do it on braids? Cause I'm like, it's the same length of hair. You just manipulate it a different way. And I was like, okay, let me try and really execute this. So then I had my mom braid my hair and I wanted to just do something different. So I did blonde and that was my first time doing blonde on myself. Cause you know, blonde on dark skin, it's like, you have to, people get real, you know? Mm-hmm. It's cute. It's cute. And I like it. Picasso. <laughs> so I did that blonde moment and it was like a thing. Like I was like taking inspo from like Pinterest and like, okay, how can I do this? But the thing is, I wasn't even practicing it. It was all me practicing and taking that moment all on camera. So like I spent two days filming that. Wow. Like once because I realized I filmed it all in slow mo. So that was a whole thing. Yeah. So Could then I had to go after and post. This? But the thing about slow mo is like it takes away the audio. Oh, yeah. so I had to redo it. But then it gave me another opportunity to then dip my braids and make it curly. So then I come up, I came up with a couple more styles. So I was like, okay, whatever. It was just about like putting the outfit back on, mm-hmm. you know, all the, the the whole thing. But once I actually finally edited it and uploaded it, it actually got no views for like a really long time. Like really? it was like maybe I think. I feel like I capped at like a thousand views for like maybe four or five months. And I was like, oh my God, this was such a waste of time. Like, <laughs> so mad. But I think it really taught me delayed gratification because like once it started to pick up, it really picked up. And I was like, look at that. I think like one point something now, but I'm like, I think it was me 
still promoting it and cross like across cross platforms, like cross promoting it. So I was taking where I got my inspo and doing side by sides of like the inspo versus what I created. And I did that on Twitter. And then I made something else for Pinterest. And then I did, I was also taking photos. So like, as I was doing the tutorial for, what is this vertical and then horizontal, I also took photos. So I used those photos for Instagram and then posted them on TikTok. It was a whole, I was, I feel like I was just playing like strategist by that time. So I think I was just kept pushing it because I'm like, it's evergreen content. It's not like it was super trendy where I can only promote it during Christmas or only promote it for, you know, people mm -hmm. always get braids no matter what season. So I was like, yeah. just kept pushing it. And then once people actually saw it, then it started to like go. So mm -hmm. my content wasn't bad. It was great. People just didn't see it at first. Right. So that taught me a lot too about like not trying to cut myself short and be like, oh, I'm never going to do this again. Cause then I did it again. <laughs> I did another 20 styles, which was crazy. Cause I didn't think I had it in me, but I did that like a year later. So I'm supposed to do another one, but yeah. You made a key point. I don't know if you realized it of creating content that's evergreen versus trendy because evergreen content is something that if you invested the two days in creating it, okay. It might've been, two days you thought wasted, right. but now it's still picking up, like you said, because the content is that good and it's always gonna be valuable, always gonna be something that people are looking for, yeah. always just relevant, basically. Yeah. The aim is really to like have your bread and butter content. I think the trending content is just to like a little dash of like, you know, I still keep my ears to the streets, but this is my content. If people were to find me, they're not going to find a bunch of trends. They're going to find my content and rabbit hole through my content. Mm -hmm. like, I, I think the aim is to try and be the trend rather than try and follow the trend. Ooh. That's a gem. That's a gem. I can get That's with my soul. So bow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think and a lot of it in this content creator journey, I've learned so much and it's like, I wish I could write a book on it. But even then, we're still learning. Like, it's, yeah. this is not taught in schools. Even the brands don't know what they be doing sometimes. <laughs> but yeah. And then I think the last viral moment was like when I bought my mom the car. That was like, I think those moments of like going through it with my mom to know what I needed to do to get there. Cause I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I just need to, I just need to get to a point where I can live on my own. And then once I was there, I was like, I just need to get to a point where I can. And I'm like, in the back of my head, she's telling me all this stress, like, oh, I'm not back home in Nigeria, like, or this with the office or this, da, da, da. And I'm just thinking to my head, like, all right, if I can just retire you, like, that's actually the big, big goal, like for me right now. I'm like, if I can just retire you so you don't have to stress about this no more. But the car was like, okay, that's one tangible thing I can do. Like, if you don't have to worry about getting from A to B and I don't have to worry about you ever trying to get into an accident or you know what I mean? I'm like, I've already lost one parent. So I don't want to, if I can put you in a p better position to just make sure you can just live life more comfortably, I'll do it. If that means I got to sacrifice me getting the car, I'll do it. Like me and my mom is, we weren't always, yeah. but now we locked in, we locked in. Wait, don't forget the Rihanna moment. Hold on. I'm oh. still on the viral period. Oh <laughs> I forgot. Sorry. Yes. Miss Riri. Miss Riri. Yeah. Met the girl, the kid. You know, there's a Fenty Beauty event I went to first and I didn't get to meet her. That was a whole thing in itself. But people remembered when I put on my story, I was like, I didn't get to meet you this time. But like, if the stars aligned. And that was before she ever announced Fenty hair. But people brought it up in the video. And I was like, I said that like y'all remember that which is crazy but people like remember those moments so it was nice to like people like to have that full circle even though the events happened only like two months apart it was like yeah divine timing mm -hmm. that was crazy but yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I have not washed i have not washed what i've worn since I <laughs> yeah, yes I she smells yeah. really good <laughs> and that's so funny because i feel like Everything was just happening all at once. I didn't even have time to like, I was sensory overload. I don't even remember <laughs> like what she smelled like. I was just like, oh my God, Rihanna. But people did say she smelled good. good. They did, other people who met her. But yeah, that was a whole moment. And I'm so glad because I feel like in the natural hair community, in the influencer community, it's also like the same isms that we deal with in 
corporate America and their day-to-day lives, you know, like texturism, racism, colorism. I'm like, they still very much exist in this same industry. So it's like trying to be seen as both a black woman, a dark skinned black woman and a dark skinned black woman who owns and wears their hair naturally and it's kinks and coils and tries to celebrate that all the time. Sometimes I feel like overlooked or not like represented well in these spaces. So I'm glad that Fenty Hair was like one of the first, well, not one of the first brands, let me not throw shade, but one of the brands who like got me out there and I got to meet that founder and the owner and that was like a whole moment. So yeah, yeah. you know, Rihanna's all for inclusivity and representation. So I was just so why not, you know? One day we'll do like a little get ready with me. It'll be me and Riri and Mark. We're doing our natural hair. You'll see one day. Yeah, speaking of <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, bro. I really be thinking like this whole journey. I'm like, this is really God's favor. Like I did not plan to be here in this way. But I'm like thriving and excelling. And it's really just betting on myself. And I feel like that's the one thing in any industry. Like if someone, if you're someone who just graduated or you're young or you're restarting something like I think betting on yourself is the best thing that you can ever do because you put a lot of faith in yourself to like, if you can do this one thing, or you can do anything. Like I feel like I can yeah. conquer the world. I don't know, but it feels great. Anyway, not to get all sappy or whatever. <laughs> I really think too the, so you said that you traveled to Barbados, which is where Rihanna is from. from. So, you know, the seeds kind of were planted there, another right. there. But you also said that you going to Barbados is what sparked your love for travel, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, can you just kind of just speak a little bit more about that and even your process of curating your trips, how you make sure that you incorporate cultural experiences when you go, how you have a goal of always just really being immersed in the, the culture and the country that you're in? Yeah, I feel like that kind of bleeds from my major of political economy. Like I, my focus on the African diaspora and the the poverty and social growth, I think there's always an aspect of like, not just economic development in these countries, but it was always a focus on black people in these spaces or in these countries, because of like, you can look at, you know, black Americans or Jamaicans, or I don't know, people in the UK, but I'm like, they're also in places like Russia and you know what I mean the places you wouldn't think of like black people still exist in these spaces so like when I first studied abroad in London and Paris like learning about the history of black people whether they were Algerian or Ethiopian or you know what I mean like Senegalese all these different communities or immigrants coming to these countries and like what that backstory looks like I feel like I've always just been drawn to that so to not just take travel content and be like travel tips I'm like trying to integrate these aspects of what I've already taught myself or like what I'm already not necessarily well-versed in, but what I love to talk about and kind of Mm -hmm. bring the two of like social issues or culture, like just trying to get people to be more mindful, very mindful, you know, but yeah, I think a lot of it is, I think it's just the way that I think about how I travel and, and walk through these spaces when I'm traveling to a different country. I think I just want to be respectful of other people's countries because there's a lot of history that comes behind that. So I'm like, not to, I think a lot of people other themselves from people instead of trying to find the similarities. Like whenever I'm in a new a new country, I'm always just like, oh, we do that too. Like Nigerians do that too. Like, I love that. You know what I mean? Like Brazilians and Nigerians are so very close in like culture, food, music. And I'm just like trying to find those, putting the puzzles together of like how we got here. I think it's so fun to me. So if I can share that with people, just have a new or different idea or mindset around traveling I think I I did my job <laughs> so yeah and I gave like a live testimonial as well because I had the pleasure <laughs> of traveling with Bola and Co or uh, linking up in Accra Ghana what was that two years ago yeah two years ago that was my first day to December experience and y'all Bola is like the perfect person to travel with because she'll send you like a template <laughs> What to bring, what to pack, what to wear, how much money to bring. I, that like, I was shook. <laughs> I was trying to get us together. We needed to get together because it was a. Wait, are you doing this December? Because I need that template. <laughs> <laughs> the way that I'm dragging my feet trying to figure out if I'm going to go or not, and it's like we're nearing mid August already. Okay. I think so. I think so. We'll see. I think I'm going to revamp the, the content and trying to start doing some like 
how to plan for Dirty December, how to get yourself together for what to expect. Yeah. 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 And what I wanted to say <laughs> too, based on what you shared, Fola, was like, you know, a lot of like influencer culture, people think like, oh, you're just here for the photo. You're just here for the moment. But I think just the way that the itinerary was built out, like I felt like we were very much in the moment. We're able to engage with each other, learn a lot. And then like somehow you already got the shot. I'm like, oh, do we need to take pictures? You're like, I'm good. And then I would later see the content like, girl, <laughs> how did you? Anyway, so I wanted to give you your props <laughs> Thank you. on that and just having a good time because I like, follow on time. She said, I 10 by 10, get in the Uber <laughs> and ready. Yeah. Get up early, she's there. So I'll try. Yeah, to, to <laughs> for like a first jam experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to touch on lately you've been talking about building community. You've been talking about community a lot, like community with friends, just community in general. Yeah. How has that been just community building going for you? Like, what do you want to achieve with building a community? And like, yeah, just kind of digging into that a little bit more. Yeah. I think for career wise with my platforms, I think it's better to have a community rather than trying to like reach for a numeric goal or like a, you know, a vanity metric, like, oh, I want to hit 100K or I want to hit 200K, whatever, whatever. I'm like, yeah, I, I can have those numbers and then only have like 200 likes. I'm like, where, you know, is that community? Where's the, the bridge of the people and like my actual people aren't there. So I'd rather fortify the community that I have now. And I, I think I've been building it since I was like, maybe at 5K even like just trying to pour back into the people who support me so that I think it just has a better feeding ground for like if people want to shout me out or just it's, or more organic, like everything doesn't feel forced rather than me trying to like then come through trying to. I don't know. It just I feel like it doesn't work like that. So I think community building there. I'm still trying to hash out what that looks like specifically, but I think just connecting with people more. I think I eventually want to get to a place where I can do in person type events that give back whether if it's like to the girls or if it's like to a shelter, you know what I mean? Like getting together to give back all together or me giving back myself. Like I think I do it in smaller ways, like trying to do giveaways or I'll just reach out to people randomly or I'll do it through the broadcast channel. So like people ha don't have to like, you know, do an arm and a leg just trying to get into the giveaway. You know, and people be like, we posted this page and tag your friend and blah, 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 like engagement farming yeah. a little bit. But I'm just like, no, I actually want to give back to the people who I always see commenting, who are always in my DMs, who are always supporting me. And I'm like, you, sh I shouldn't feel like I have to put you through the the hoops to do that. You are support me in every which way. So in that way, I think personally too, like I think living in LA and I just posted content of like me at home. I'm like a hermit, but when I'm traveling, I'm such an adventurous girly, but I'm like at home, I want to like start doing more adventurous stuff so i'm in communities rather than just like going to an influencer event or going to a party i feel like there's other ways to build community and if that's just me having one-on-one -on -one dates like with tanina when we went on our food date yes. stuff like that i think is better for building a community and i think having a community offline supports you in being online as well so that's true and one, I resonated with that post so much. I felt like that was definitely me. I feel like, dang, my life is so dang boring when I'm not on the trip. But it's okay. It's fine. Keep on. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Let me stop. But I also, I think you posted, I think you posted this months ago where in trying to build community slash just put more energy into your friendships, like habit stacking, mm -hmm. but like, social habit stacking so like if you're already mm -hmm. going to and it kind of it changed my perspective on how i see like connecting with my friends like it doesn't always have to be a formal dinner or like mm -hmm. we're going to a party together or like we're doing something out of our normal routine so i really like that you mentioned that and like oh if i'm getting my nails done let me just hit up one of my friends if they're down sure if they're not it's okay yeah but i actually got that from a podcast i'm gonna like plug in Another girl is a ba balanced black girl. Oh, it's sure. less. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, I heard that through, she was doing like a friendship podcast, but basically, yeah, like habit stacking, but with friends. So like if you're already doing something, 
try to just make that a moment with a friend so that it's not like you're going out of your way to change up your whole routine or you have to spend money or you have to go out, you have to, you know what I mean? So yeah, I should do that more actually. I haven't done that yet, but I also try and do at least two dates, two friendship dates a month. I try to do it like once every week, yeah. but just to get in some like FaceTime because yeah. it's also hard with like being your own like boss and running your own business and then traveling. Like sometimes I feel like, oh my God, I'm always juggling. I just, as adults really too, I think juggling, like trying to keep in touch with your family and making sure you're texting your friends and then trying to date and then you know, all these and things. Being healthy oh and drinking water and taking <laughs> vitamins, like dang. Yeah, like working out, like I can't. One, one thing's gonna have to suffer. Something's gonna have to go, I don't yeah. know. Just trying to fit in how you get in, you know? Yeah. So. And I think it's important to look at it as seasons of things. So like where obviously you want to, you want to cater to your emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, all of that. But in each season or like quarter or something, something's getting more energy and then it just kind of shifts around. I feel like if you don't do it that way, at least to me, it just is so overwhelming trying to be like super perfect at everything, but just dedicating seasons to things. It's, It's helped me just think that way. And I think different yeah no but i can't come and kill myself so i can't kill myself i have to do something in increments <laughs> small little please, please. <laughs> fola i wanted to ask when you get overwhelmed with life and like social media in general like do you ever like detox or like what do you do to preserve like your you know your like your peace basically i think that's something i actually need to get better at i think i've been it's hard to say because i feel like when I get overwhelmed, when I was doing this all by myself without a manager, or without an assistant, I think I would just like, it just, it'd be just burnout. And I would have to take a break from social media, but social media was also what I needed to like be financially stable. So it's like th- those two could not mix, but I'm also trying to get better at, at having a better wellness routine so that those things don't fall through the cracks. But now that I have the means to delegate, like getting a manager or having, being on a management agency or having an assistant or trying to just like, just delegate in general. Like if, even if you don't have the means, but if you have the community or the resources to like, okay, can I have my sister? Like before my sister would come and help me make content, like she would be the one trying to record for me. And I would try to do like, can you help me do this or flip it this Aww. way? Or, or like, can you, <laughs> I'll pay you in product or I'll pay you in food <laughs> or anything to like come and help me. So I think relying on my community, but also having a better wellness routine so that I'm taking care of myself. Because sometimes I would wake up and I'd, I'd like sleep next to my laptop and wake up next to my laptop and just work, work, work. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that is not conducive for anything healthy. So yeah, wellness, community. And if you have the means, delegate to somebody who can really, really, really help. I love that because my little sister is basically the same way. She's always like helping us behind the scenes, taking pictures and everything. So shout out to her. But yeah, do you ever feel pressure to use that journey too, like your wellness journey or self-care routines? Do you ever like feel pressure to record that and make that content too? Like, Yes. I just had a strategy call where my managers were like, right, let's do more lifestyle. And I'm just like, that comes back to the teetering between what I want to show and what I don't want to show. Mm-hmm. And okay, if I open this door, I have to be really specific with and how I choose to showcase these things. So I do sometimes think about like, okay, how could I make this something so that I can like now segue into the lifestyle category so I don't box myself into natural hair, just beauty. It's hard because I'm just like, I don't want my whole life to just be content. Like I, some things I just want to keep for myself and I'm just like, yeah. And these things I'm like, oh, I fall off. But now I'm like creating. Well, I did one video that was like a lifestyle video of me figuring it out in my 20s. And it was me just being vulnerable, vulnerable about things that I'm just not good at, which is like waking up early enough to like not just be rushing to a meeting or like not working super late or missing out on food or when I'm supposed to eat or trying to cook for myself or trying to take my Yoruba lessons or forgetting to hang out with friends. You know what I mean? All those things that we try to balance, but it's hard to balance those things as an adult because you just, it's hard. I don't know who's doing it, but we're all just figuring it out. So that is, it can be a thing that I'm trying to tap into, just showcasing me just figuring it out. And that's definitely relatable because sometimes when you do consume so much, the internet makes you feel like you're behind or like you're not like doing anything really. But 
in reality, everybody has their, you know, their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. A lot of times, yeah, I'm like, people think I have it together or I look so put together. And I'm just like, girl, if I gave you the tea, <laughs> the tea you would know. But yeah, I think also trying to, I mean, that's the double edged sword with social media too. It's like you want to showcase that you are still figuring it out and giving people the motivation to like, I don't have it all together and you cannot have it all together too and it still be okay. Mm -hmm. But then people are also taking that vulnerability and using it against you. So it's just like those like trying to teeter between, all right, do I have enough of the, you know what I mean, strength to like put this online and if there's backlash against it or whatever the case is, I can still push forward and not take it personally. So you did mention something about Yoruba lessons. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like what inspired you to want to, you know, tap in and learn your native language? How's that been going? I feel like I've been ridiculing my parents for so long. It was really when I studied abroad in London and I realized how much of them, like second, what was that? Second generation mm -hmm. of Nigerians there spoke their language and we didn't. And I was like, I know it's a geographical thing because they're so far away, especially like we're not even in New York. Well, I'm not in New York. I'm mm -hmm. on, obviously in L.A. Like we're just we don't go back as often. And then mm -hmm. our my parents don't didn't teach me growing up. And then also on top of that, like making fun of me, like they would kiki with their my aunts and uncles. Like, oh, yeah, she, she thought it was Spanish. Well, uh -huh. I'm in SoCal. That's <laughs> what I say all the time. I'm not even mad because that's what I say. What would you think I thought it was? Mind you, I'm in, when I said that, I was like five. They took it and ran with it. They thought it was so funny, hilarious. Anyway, I say that to say when I got to London and I realized that my mates were doing it and I wasn't, I read my parents to Phil. I said, oh, absolutely. Y'all messed up. Because <laughs> how can they speak it? And I can't. Mind yeah. you, I'm someone who's, they pushed me academics wise to get it together skip fourth grade do this that and other and i don't speak my own language yeah mm. yeah yeah the crazy thing is you know they'd be pushing they'd be like oh they want you to pass down the culture pass down the culture but a big yeah. part of that is knowing the language and it's like right no, yeah. i have to pass you have to give me the culture you have to exactly. pass it down if i have to pass it down mm -hmm. so that was a whole thing so that was like 2016 when i first just started seeing what was possible because they kept saying like you know you're older like it's gonna be harder for you da, da, da. like it just felt like discouraging and then when my dad passed and I just realized like oh shit if my mom is gone too I have no one else well I mean I have aunts and uncles but like we're not as close and they have we have family friends out here but I'm like it's not the same as my parents so I'm like trying to figure out how can I still get that culture that those aspects of the culture and learn it for myself, even if that means I have to pay for it, even if that means I have to seek out my own resources for it so that I can pass it down to the generation after me or my kids mm -hmm. or whatever cases. So I think that was one of the huge things. And because I had other, I think I also engulfed myself in the Nigerian community because I mean, we're small in LA, we're small on the West Coast period. So like I was in the Nigerian Association and when I was in college and like the dance, 